started, I have a few housekeeping tips. We do have Cheryl, our ASL interpreter on today's call. We're presenting in gallery view, so the interpreter should always be visible. Captions are available in Zoom. Click show subtitle in your Zoom menu bar to turn them on. We will be sharing a Google presentation with photos. All photos will have audio descriptions along with closed captions. You do not need to be on Zoom to access the call. We will read all questions out loud so that the content will be available to individuals calling in on the phone or who cannot see the visual content. The call is being recorded and it will be posted to our website for future use. At the end of the session, we will have a Q&A part and you can submit your questions in the Q&A tab located on the bottom of your menu bar. You can also email me at kelly at kdrcommunications.com. That's K-E-L-L-Y at kdrcommunications.com. I will put that email address in the chat box as well. You can also press star nine if you are dialing into the call and it will notify me you have a question. We ask that you do please reserve this option as an accommodation for people who need it or are only on the telephone. Now that we have covered those important points, we can get started with our program. It is my pleasure to introduce Mary Dolan, co-founder and executive director of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, who will moderate today's event. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you everyone from the FDR Memorial Legacy team for your hard work on this webinar. I'm Mary Dolan, executive director of the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee, and I'm one of the co-founders along with Jane DeLand and Jim Dixon. I am a white female and I have blonde graying hair and I'm wearing a white shirt and a gray jacket. I use she and her. The FDR committee is the friends group for the FDR Memorial in Washington, DC. Born out of the fight for representation at the FDR Memorial, we were established in 2019 to ensure that the disability community and the disability history of the memorial was not forgotten. We help educators teach the disability story of the FDR Memorial, about the campaign for the wheelchair statue and about FDR's disability and its influence on his leadership. As our work develops, we will partner with organizations to ensure other underrepresented narratives of the FDR and Eleanor story are part of the memorial. Uh, part of the memorial's experience. We are also dedicated to the full inclusion at the memorial and press for long overdue accessibility improvements. We strive to ensure that the memorial itself is preserved for future generations. Education, inclusion, preservation, that is what we are all about. I invite you to learn more about us at our website, www.fdr memoriallegacy.com, we'll put that in the chat. The FDR committee commissioned this independent report that you will soon hear about to put to rest any doubt, any question about the braille and access issues for blind and low vision people at the FDR memorial. We are thrilled with the coverage this report has received in today's Washington Post by reporter Teresa Vargas, uh, we will put that article link also in the chat. Uh, hope that you give it a read. Please know that we continue to celebrate the art of Robert Graham at the FDR Memorial and the design of Lawrence Halperin. But art, like parks, like museums, need accessibility features to boost access. And that responsibility falls to the Department of Interior's National Park Service. And so in the spirit of partnership and accountability, and on this Global Accessibility Awareness Day, we gift this report to the Department of Interior's National Park Service. The FDR Memorial was dedicated May 2nd, 1997, and the first reports about access issues for blind and low vision came out that month in the press. When the prologue room was dedicated January 10, 2001, there were more stories, it's documented. So imagine my surprise when coming back to this work in 2019 after nearly 20 years and finding the same problem, a lack of awareness, and dare I say a lack of interest in prioritizing it. We in the disability community have been quiet for over 20 years 
and the two decades of grace period is over. I want to thank Senator Tammy Duckworth and Representative Eleanor Holmes Norton, who both introduced in the Senate and the House respectively resolutions calling for access improvements at the memorial. And thank you to their co-sponsors who we are proud to say come from both sides of the aisle. A quick note about the photos that we will show today. The majority of them were taken when Dr. Fogel Hatch visited the memorial March 17, 2021. We will indicate where photos are used that are not from that visit. Now I have the great pleasure to introduce pre-recorded remarks by the primary author of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Senator Tom Harkin. Senator Harkin served five Senate terms and prior to that was in the House of Representatives. At the end of his time in the Senate, he was chair of the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor and Pensions. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, and all our guests, uh, we'll cue the video now for the one and only Senator Tom Harkin. Park Service need to listen to disability leaders about what they need and what is needed at this memorial. In fact, suggestions and advice was given in 1997 and again in 2001 when the prologue room was opened. Now, I'm a lifelong adherent to the political, economic, and social justice philosophy of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is a fantastic memorial to him and to his legacy. But steps must be taken to not just meet, as I said, the minimum requirements uh, for the Americans with Disabilities Act, but to do state-of-the-art to make accessibility at the FDR Memorial the best so that other entities, uh, uh, both public and private, will see this and set this as their goal for accessibility and inclusion. So I am hopeful that the National Park Service uh, will include the suggestions from this report of Dr. Fogel Hatches. And I would urge them to do it soon in fact, I hope that the National Park Service would include these suggestions, act upon them, implement them before the 25th anniversary of the FDR Memorial, which is next May 2nd, 2022. And I certainly hope to be there. So thank you again. And uh, let's move ahead in making accessibility at the FDR Memorial the best that there can be. Of Senator Tom Harkin, we're so pleased that he was able to uh, prepare uh, remarks and share them with us, and also to have him as a member of the FDR Cassidy Board. So thank you, Senator Harkin. Next, I want to introduce to you another great American, Mr. Gordon Gund. Many know Mr. Gund's name from his involvement in professional sports um, as a leader in business and also from his work as co-founder of the Fed Fighting Blindness. Uh, I'm not the biggest NBA fan. I'm ashamed to say that I had not heard of Gund Arena. Uh, and that's Gund as in G-U-N-D um, for the interpreter. Uh, I just heard from my boss at that time, Mike DeLand, who was chairman of the National Organization on Disability, talk about his friend, Gordon, who was a great skier, and he also happened to be blind. When Mike led the fundraising for the FDR wheelchair statue, he turned to this friend, Gordon, and as Mike said at the January 10, 2001 dedication ceremony for the prologue room, he, in, uh, and I quote, Gordon inst instantly saw the impact this statue would have. Mr. Gunn went on to contribute most generously to the prologue room and the wheelchair statue. And without his leading gift, the room and the, chair, the wheelchair statue would not be there today. Uh, Mr. Gund was kind enough to also tape remor remarks, which um, I am very pleased to um, play for you right now. Uh, Mike at that time was chairman of the National Organization on Disability 
and was going to lead that fight for that representation, with which I fully agreed. And I, I first got to know Mike um, when he and I were serving in the U.S. Navy as officers and ended up serving on the same destroyer in the Western Pacific, got to know each other well. And, and we left the Navy a couple of years later and went on about the rest of our lives. And during that time after the Navy, uh, Mike, Mike um, uh, began to need to use a wheelchair more and more. And he, uh, he became, he really used it quite a bit. And at the same time, I became blind. So both of us were disabled, just like President Roosevelt. Uh, when, when Mike asked me if I would um, help donate uh, sufficient, significant funds to, to the room of the memorial, of the FDR memorial, which was gonna house a statue of that uh, of one of our great presidents in in a way that he that he was much of his term as as president his three plus terms um, I I immediately agreed to do that because I felt that uh, it was very important for future generations to know that greatness can come in all types and forms and and with that representation they would know that for sure so. Uh, happily, what what um, what I think is is important now, because it uh, it's it looks the memorial looks terrific in lots of ways, but it is not yet accessible to everybody, and until it is, it won't really reach its goals. Accessibility is a legal requirement, and the laws that that make that so were were hard fought and hard won by uh, long battles. Uh, bought by the disability community. So I urge the National Park Service to take this report very seriously and to work closely with the, uh, the FDR Memorial Committee and its advisory board to follow those recommendations and carry them out and to work on any other aspect of this that will help to make the FDR Memorial a, a leader in inclusion and accessibility. Thank you. We are all very thankful to Mr. Gunn for his tremendous generosity um, and also his generosity that it makes our work now at the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee possible. So thank you. So now to the moment we've all been waiting for, to the report. Um, I also have the great pleasure and honor to introduce you to Dr. Cheryl Fogel Hatch. Dr. Fogel Hatch received her PhD in anthropology from the University of New Mexico. She is an anthropologist, archeologist, accessibility consultant, preservationist and principal of her own firm. Her complete CV and more information about her work, we'll put that in the chat. Um, she is a sought after cultural site access expert and we were most fortunate to have her work with us on this project. I will turn it all over now to Dr. Fogel Hatch and we thank you, Doctor, once again for your commitment to this work. Thanks, Mary. I am pleased to be giving this presentation today. Uh, my description, I am a white woman. I have shoulder length brown hair. I'm wearing a purple top today. So today I am presenting on the accessibility of the FDR Memorial. I will share observations that I made during my visit in March, and I will make some recommendations for improvements. First, I will talk about the representation of Braille depicted on the walls of the memorial itself. The Braille ranges from somewhat readable to completely unrecognizable. This includes the quotes in the prologue room and the letters on the worker's mural and the quotes on the columns in room one. This assessment is based on two facts. One, differences in the horizontal and vertical spacing, and two, contrast in raised versus indented dots. Wheelchair statue was like solving a puzzle. I think that I put more effort into it than the average braille reader might. Here is my strategy. I checked the carved print letters above 
And then I could recognize the braille dots grouped immediately below as the corresponding letter. There is about an inch of space between the letters. Due to the large scale, I had trouble determining where one word stopped and the next one started. Knowing the words in the quote beforehand helped me solve the braille puzzle. Even so, I had to spell out the words letter by letter as someone might when learning braille. Audio description. This is Dr. Fogel Hatch, a dark haired woman with a ponytail and a face mask. With her left hand, she is touching raised dots under the word Franklin on a bronze bas relief on a stone wall. With her right hand, she is holding a paper and a white cane. Thank you, Mary. The letters on the room one workers mural are recognizable, but the words are not because of the variation in vertical and horizontal spacing. I could recognize the letters WPA individually, but differences in vertical and horizontal spacing made it impossible to read the whole acronym as a complete word. I expect the variation in vertical and horizontal spacing of print letters may cause similar reading difficulties for people with cognitive disabilities. Audio description. This is a picture of room one in the FDR Memorial. On the stone wall is a bas relief with four large square panels. Each panel has different pictures and markings. Some appear raised. The bas relief is weathered and discolored greenish and brownish colors. In the foreground, you see three cylinder columns that have artistic renderings. Some appear raised or indented. Like the bas relief, the art on the columns are of various hues of green and brown. Photo by Mike Oliver, May 6, 2021. Thank you, Mary. The braille on the columns is completely unreadable because the dots are indented. They feel like holes in the stone and they are not recognizable as dots. Furthermore, the horizontal and vertical spacing varies as the indentations circle the columns. The irregular spacing on the print letters around the columns might also be a problem for people with cognitive disabilities. This is Dr. Fogel Hatch. With her left hand, she is touching one of the columns in the memorial. With her right hand, she holds a white cane. She is wearing a handbag across her body. Thank you, Mary. But sighted visitors cannot know the contradictions expressed by the abstract artwork. That invites tactile experience. They think that the braille is accurate, but it is manipulated in size and spacing to the extent that it is distorted when read by touch. My evaluation of the oversized and abstract braille described on the FDR Memorial has been left out of previous accessibility reviews made by the National Park Service. These issues of representation are important, and I believe that that aspect of the artwork deserves a place in any newly created interpretive media. An article in the press in May 1997 documents the inaccurate braille on the columns and the workers' mural. It, in that article, three people who are blind described the problems with the size and spacing of the braille. They explained the small scale at which braille is read under the fingertips is incompatible with a large scale of the monument. Most visitors have no idea that there are differences between braille and print, and sighted people view the depiction of the braille as accurate. This issue can be addressed by creating interpretive media such as signs or other NPS materials. It's comparable to the statue of FDR in room four where the desk chair with wheels was 
substitute it for his actual wheelchair. An acknowledgement of this parallel between inaccurate braille and the desk chair with wheels enriches the experience of all visitors because it shows the extent of the misperceptions about crucial tools that people with disabilities use to perform so many essential daily tasks. Audio description. This picture shows the heroic sized FDR statue with a dog to the side on a raised platform. This picture has an inlay of the back of the FDR statue showing the small wheel or caster that was included as a depiction of one of the types of chairs FDR used with wheels affixed to the bottom. Stock photo with inlay photo from Autistic Reality. Thank you, Mary. Now I'm going to discuss the statues, life-sized and oversized. I explored most of the life-sized statues, the wheelchair statue in the prologue room, and the sculptural groups in room two, like the urban breadline and the man listening to a fireside chat. Climbing onto the pedestals of the larger than life-size statues of FDR and Eleanor Roosevelt in room four was a fun adventure, even though I still could not reach their heads. My tactile exploration ended at their hands. Audio description. This is the front view of the heroic sized statue of FDR wearing a cape. Near him is his beloved dog, Fala. FDR and Fala are on a raised platform. In the picture, viewing the statues are two people. One is in a wheelchair and the other stands with a dog on a leash. Photo, Mike Oliver, May 2021. Thank you, Mary. Now I will discuss some safety concerns about the fountains at the memorial. I had difficulty finding some of the barriers placed around the broken fountains. The access board states that barriers should be no more than 27 inches in height so that they can be detected by a person using a white cane. If objects are greater than 27 inches in height, a person's cane will go under the objects and the person will not detect it. Audio description. In this picture, Dr. Fogel Hatch stands in front of a non-working fountain that is framed by large stones. Behind her, white chains appear and the bottom of a stanchion, and, and the bottom of a stanchion, pardon me, to her right is a direct drop-off a few feet into the dry fountain. Directly in front of her is another drop-off with no barricade or stanchion. To her left is a large square stone. Thank you. The stanchions around the fountains at the higher elevation than the sidewalk were only detectable because I found the steps leading up to the fountains. However, when the fountain is in ground, flush with or lower than the surrounding sidewalk, I had more trouble finding the barriers. Furthermore, it is possible that the stanchions could be moved and no one blind or sighted would be warned of the hazard. In my opinion, the most dangerous fountain is the in-ground fountain in room one because it drops off a couple of feet straight down with no difference in elevation between the lip of the fountain and the surrounding sidewalk. The stanchions should be replaced by a guardrail. Posts drilled into the sidewalk would be cane detectable. Audio description. This is a photo of Dr. Fogel Hatch in the memorial. She is standing a few steps away from a non-functioning fountain at the memorial. Two stanchions are floating in stagnant water. A white chain dangles into the water. There is no barricade and the floor Cheryl stands on is flush with the fountain. Thank you, Mary. The other safety issue that we noticed was flooding of the tidal basin that covered the sidewalk. When we started walking down the path from the pagoda to the MLK Memorial, a park employee informed us that it was flooded. We took the alternate path that went upslope from the tidal basin. We recognize that flooding affects all visitors, 
but we also noticed that the signs for the accessible route directed visitors to use paths that are regularly underwater. Audio description. This is the tidal basin, a body of water. There is signage pointing to wheelchair access. The whole area is flooded. In the distance, you see the Washington Monument. It is a cloudy day. Starting with the Braille representation on the FDR Memorial itself. I observed that the Braille carved into the memorial is not accurate representation of that writing system because it is of inconsistencies in size and spacing. I think that it is important to add signs in print and Braille at normal scale to explain that the sculptures created abstract art. In compliance with the Commemorative Works Act of 1986, signs in print and Braille at correct scale could be mounted on wayside interpretive panels rather than directly on the walls of the memorial. Standards for Braille signage are found in ADA Table 703.31. For, for the prologue room, I think the panel could be located between the wheelchair statue and the bar relief. It could be positioned so that visitors would approach it from either side of the wheelchair statue. I also recommend the creation of other panels more accurately interpreting the Braille as abstract art on the worker's mural and the columns. I had some suggestions for updating the Braille brochure. The papers you saw in the pictures today are the Braille brochure for the FDR Memorial. It is a transcription of the print brochure discussing the statues and the memorial. I think that an updated Braille brochure should also include text describing the layout of the memorial and the current brochure mentions five outdoor rooms, but does not explain how they are oriented, compass directions, or how to navigate through them, descriptions like clockwise, right to left, etc. Information that describes the layout of the FDR Memorial could also be incorporated into the Braille brochure and into other products such as an audio described tour or mobile guides available on the park website. I also make recommendations about mobile guides and wayfinding. The FDR Memorial website could be updated to include a mobile guide. A well-designed website can provide information to everyone it can be written in plain language to help people with cognitive disabilities, and it can include descriptions of images and text directions useful for people who are blind. A mobile, device, mobile guide can be accessed by smartphone, and this lets people with disabilities use their preferred accessibility settings to read the information. I have published on this topic, and these references are in the report. The advantage of a mobile website is that it is compatible with mobile pho phones manufactured by different manufacturers. A mobile guide must also comply with web content accessibility guidelines. And during and the COVID-19 pandemic and presumably long after, visitors prefer to receive content on their own devices. My report documents references for this in the museum field. In conclusion, in this report, I explored the accessibility of the FDR Memorial from planning my visit to my experience at the site. I offered my observations and recommendations in hopes of bridging the accessibility gaps for visitors with disabilities, primarily those who are blind or have low vision. Improvements can be made in five categories. Number one, interpretation of the Braille depicted on the walls of the memorial itself. Uh, number two, updating the Braille brochure. Number three, availability of tactile models of the memorial itself and the oversized statues. Number four, text-based directions and wayfinding added to the brochures and websites. And number five, mitigation of safety concerns caused by issues of deferred maintenance. My review of documentation provided by the National Park Service indicates that park staff have proposed solutions for categories three through five, tactile models, wayfinding, and mitigating safety concerns. In those cases, 
my recommendations are offered to strengthen future projects. Likewise, my suggestion for improvement and updating of the Braille brochure and large bro print brochures are given in hopes of making publications more usable for visitors who are blind or who have low vision. My evaluation of the oversized and abstract Braille depicted on the FDR Memorial has been left out of previous accessibility reviews. These issues of representation are important, and I believe that aspect of the artwork deserves a place in any newly created interpretive media. I would welcome the chance to discuss such issues with park staff and consultants. And that is the gist of my report. Thank you. Description, Dr. Fogel Hatch stands next to the statue of FDR in a wheelchair. She has her arm around his shoulder. Thank you so much for that thorough report. Uh, we really do appreciate it. Um, at this time, we're going to transition into the Q&A segment. I would like to remind everybody um, that we will be accepting questions via the Q&A um, tab located on the bottom of your menu bar. You can also email questions directly to me at kelly, K-E-L-L-Y, at kdrcommunications.com, and I will put that email in the chat box again. You can press star nine if you are dialing into the call to raise your hand. Um, and if you have a specific question for one of the participants, please do indicate that. Um, I did receive a few questions uh, as part of the registration, so I'm going to go ahead and start with one of those while we collect other uh, questions from the audience. So I will start with, how is this program planning to make arts education accessible to our students? And I'll throw that out to Mary and Cheryl. <laughs> sure, absolutely. That, thank you so much for that question. Well, it, most certainly we want to be able to have as many students from all around the country, all around the world coming to the memorial. And we want them all to be able to access it in the way that works best for them. So that's uh, our fundamental um, goal right there. Um, there are some incredible things though to learn about the memorial, the architecture, the landscape design, the art is, is fantastic. I still have a lot to learn. I can foresee us at some point developing um, and working with educators to, to help teach students more about that art, how it was developed. Uh, public art is, is a profession. Um, and so we would absolutely like to um, work through um, uh, how, how to improve um, the accessibility within art um, and ensuring that um, all art also uh, receives the, the attention it needs from uh, those who install it and those who give, who take care of it so that they provide those alternative ways of accessing the arts for full inclusion for all. Cheryl, would you add anything to that? That was a very complete and thorough answer. I just am thinking about college and design classes because of another project I work with and how fun it would be to set up a lesson plan about art and perception and with that create a tactile trunk and send out uh, replicas of some of these things. Although you wouldn't quite get the, the size issues without being there, but it could be fun. Great, thank you for that. Uh, I think this next question, everybody um, probably has on their minds. Why are we still fighting for our rights? Let's see, I don't know. Uh, doctor, uh, you've got the PhD, so maybe you go first. Because uh, those who don't have disabilities don't think about it. Uh, ableism is real, and sometimes when they think about it, they don't think about resolving issues of inclusion. 
and sometimes it is the role of the disability community to be the squeaky wheel in the theory that as you know some of my relatives would say the squeaky wheel gets the grease so that's you know just keep your mm -hmm. hand in in it that's all mm -hmm. i really have <laughs> Right. Um, and, um, and I would just, yeah, squeaky wheel indeed. Um, it's um, for those of you out there who have been squeaky wheels in, in, um, in your life, you know who you are, you know, it is tiresome. Um, but sometimes it takes a couple of decades of squeaky wheeling, um, most definitely to get things done. So we're here, we're, we're gonna keep squeaky wheeling on this one. Um, and our goal is to make sure that this memorial is going to be one of the best, if not the best in inclusion and accessibility. We, our community, our city in Washington, DC deserves no less. So um, keep, you know, hope you all follow us and come squeak with us. <laughs> Great. Um, we have a nice comment from Michael Thornton. Uh, he says, having been to the memorial several times, I never realized how inaccessible it is to people with vision issues. Also, I did not realize the safety issues regarding the chains and the poles. Let's hope that they do make things better and safer soon. Um, he was also just there over Mother's Day weekend. So thank you for that comment. Uh, we also have a question from uh, Dr. Arlene Kingberry. Uh, how can students and residents of the District of Columbia support improving accessibility to the FDR Memorial? Go ahead, Mary. I'll, yeah, I'll jump in there. Um, I um, join us. Um, make your voice known. Um, see something, say something. That also applies to accessibility, everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I had been to the FDR Memorial a bunch of times and, and I saw the, uh, the t uh, dangerous um, ways that the stanchions uh, were, uh, you know, knocked over and pushed over and, um, and so, you know, we need to discuss these things. So this is the memorials, the national parks are the backyards of Washingtonians. We have to claim it as ours. We have to take care of it. We need to speak up and act as a community. Um, the other thing I would say is that we are working with the University of the District of Columbia on an education program, which we were absolutely so proud to work with that fine institution, the public university of DC and an HBCU. Um, and we are starting with education about the fight for the wheelchair statue, um, about how disability, um, the leadership uh, of FDR uh, alongside his disability and, and the leadership of many leaders in the disability community. Um, so those stories need to be told. Um, along the lines, all of that's gonna to be told and all of that's going to be taught in a thoroughly accessible way. So we hope to include as many teachers and classrooms in DC and eventually throughout the country in learning about dis the disability movement, this particular piece of the disability movement um, and, and the various stories and, uh, that come from the FDR Memorial um, and particularly looking at those that um, are not yet told when you visit the memorial. Um, we call them the underrepresented stories or unrepresented or almost to be lost narratives. Would you add anything, Dr. Fogel Hatch? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Great. Um, this is from Elizabeth. She asked, was there an issue, um, was there an issue for you with the oversized statues whereby you would recommend smaller size statues in the future? Or did I misunderstand that? She said, thank you so much for your presentation. Oh, no. Yeah, no problem. I, the oversized statues, I mean, I like to climb on things. It's, you know, I, I, I found it fun, but I never did get to reach up to the heads. So it would be excellent to have models at 
smaller scale uh, part of the issue with the statues is that they're on the platform. So you have to step up about, what, two feet to get to them, to even touch them. So yes, there should be tactile models that are in an easier place to get to and at maybe life-size scale, maybe slightly smaller than oversized scale. But those are design considerations. And uh, I do go into that a little bit more in my report. And I will add that we will be posting the full report on the FDR Memorial Legacy Committee website. Um, that will be done this afternoon, as well as the recording of this live event. So please make sure to visit our website. I will put that link in the chat as well um, as follow up. So Christopher Roosevelt has asked a question. Could you please address whether or not the MPS has received Dr. Fogelhatch's report, whether they have had an opportunity to respond, and whether the MPS was invited to participate in this webinar? Um, if the MPS has the report or is going to receive it, how long should the world await their response to what clearly is a legal requirement, full compliance with the ADA? Mm. Thank you. I'll, I'll um, first jump in on that and then uh, ask Dr. Fogelhatch to please chime in uh, very much with her expertise. Uh, indeed, this report was sent to the acting director of the National Park Service and to the superintendent uh, of the National Mall, um, along with an invitation for um, to participate and give remarks at this event. Uh, uh, the invitation to participate was declined. Um, so we know that they have the report and we're, we're very pleased to be, to be giving it to them. I do hope that uh, it is uh, received in the spirit that we are uh, presenting it to them to uh, give them the tools, the expertise, uh, and the final, <laughs> the final know-how about, about what, what, is, um, what is amiss. Um, as to how long the world should wait, um, I hope we don't have to wait very long. Um, I, I have a sense that uh, folks at the Park Service hopefully also read the Washington Post. So I hope that they saw that news article. I hope that gives the, the needed nudge. Um, but, um, you know, Chris, uh, it makes me think about um, Mike DeLand all those years ago and Alan Reich, the leaders of the National Organization on Disability, Jim Dixon also, um, and how it took several years. Um, I don't want us to have to take several years to talk about this with them because the, it's, it's, uh, it's clear what needs to be done. Um, but we're not gonna, you know, we're gonna make sure that, that we, um, we hopefully do get an answer quickly. Uh, Dr. Fogel Hatch, perhaps you can um, be a little more eloquent on that. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing wrong with your eloquence there. I would say that when we get a response, I would expect certain things to take time in terms of design uh, funding issues. I would guess that it's simpler for them to pretend to ignore the report because then they don't have to address the funding, timeline, design, any of those kinds of priorities. I am not an expert on federal budgets or park processes or appropriations, but it's an agency. And so it's probably always going to be slower than we'd like, but here's hoping that uh, they will respond to our report and begin the process. And, and I would just chime in there that um, I, if you're out there and you're a squeaky wheel too, and uh, you like what you're hearing, um, um, please be in touch with us because we'd love to have as many uh, folks um, advocating with us and joining us in, in our request for this to, to get finally prioritized. Um, I did want to just say one thing about the, there was a question about the size of the statues. Um, I, I wanted to give a, um, a, a, a nod to uh, Robert Graham. Uh, who is the sculptor who did the life-sized FDR wheelchair statue that is so beloved um, at the, he listened to the disability community uh, before he did his artwork. And the request was to have a statue that could be fully enjoyed at all angles 
Uh, and so what you get when you go to the memorial is just as you saw at that last photo that we, sh we showed you of Dr. Fogel Hatch, she has her arm around FDR. It is remarkable, the interaction between people and that statue. Um, I've seen folks get out of their wheelchairs to sit on his lap. I've seen little kids sit on his lap. I've seen all kids hugging him. I've seen them patting him on the head. Um, but it was done to invite that interaction. Um, there certainly can still be heroic sized statues, but there is something to be said about um, that life sized away from the wall, um, not on a pedestal. Um, and I think you can see that when you actually go to the memorial and the type of interaction it invites. Uh, Mary, I was wondering if you would like to take a moment or two and give a recap on the work and advocacy around the tidal basin uh, flooding. We did show that photo in the report. Um, so I thought it might be helpful to give a little bit of background around that work being done. Absolutely. Thank you. That's a great, um, great thing to bring up. Um, uh, climate change, um, it's happening and it's affecting all sorts of areas, including our, in our hometown of Washington. And it's um, the area around the tidal basin is sinking. Um, and that includes the FDR Memorial. It also includes the Martin Luther King Memorial, uh, Jefferson, um, Lincoln as well to a lesser degree because it's a little bit up a slope from what I understand. Um, not much, but a little bit. Um, so um, the National Park Service along with the National Trust for Historic Preservation, um, make sure I get all the groups there, um, uh, the Trust for the National Mall uh, with support from American Express. Um, and I apologize if I'm leaving out any, any other entities that were involved. Uh, commissioned uh, five um, leading landscape design companies uh, to dream up um, what could happen uh, or, or what, what could be a, uh, some resolutions to the climate change, the land um, lowering around the tidal basin, which would make um, uh, constant flooding a reality. Uh, you saw a picture in our um, presentation, uh, which showed uh, flooding at the um, at the tidal basin right next to the FDR memorial, and that happens routinely. Um, so it, this isn't something that needs to be addressed in ten years, twenty years. It's something that um, everyone needs to start thinking about immediately. Um, so there is on the table um, a what's called the Tidal Basin Ideas Lab, uh, which are some ideas that have been presented by these firms um, on what might be done, um, how, to, how to save our national treasures. Uh, I invite you to go to the Tidal Basin Ideas Lab um, website. Kelly, maybe you could post that up there. That's on the website for the... Um, uh, the Trust for the National Mall. Um, you can see the different designs, the different ideas. Uh, we, we did issue an open letter uh, regarding um, the design, um, some of the, about one of the designs that is presented. Uh, we invite you to, to read that as well. Kelly, if you wouldn't mind, I'm sorry to, <laughs> to ask you so much, but, um, but it's a, something that we all need to pay attention to because um, I think one thing we need to remember as is as a disability community, our um, our voice is not often immediately heard, even though it's put out there, it's not immediately listened to. So we need to make sure that we're protecting our investments. You know, uh, it matters that disability leaders fought for this statue uh, at the FDR memorial. memorial. It matters. It matters that the Martin Luther King Memorial is right next to the FDR Memorial. It makes for a beautiful um, connection in disability rights being civil rights. So we need to make sure that there is accurate and responsible and uh, respectful treatment of all the memorials. 
And um, and so I, again, uh, if you're interested in learning more about it, I'm happy to, to, to talk more about it. But for the meantime, I invite you to read up about it um, and also check out our open letter if you wish and just track the Tidal Basin uh, Ideas Lab. And uh, we do need to all come together with some resolution uh, so that we don't lose these treasures. Um, but um, it's something that we will, we look forward to being part of. Great, thank you for that. Uh, one quick question, and then Mary, if you wanna wrap it up. Um, we had a question from Carrie. She actually worked with Dr. Fogelhatch, or she's met Dr. Fogelhatch in the past. But her question is, uh, is there public transportation yet to the memorial? There is metro access. I'm not sure how direct it is um, to the National Mall. I think it would be the Smithsonian Washington Monument stop. And I'm not sure the distance. And I haven't looked up uh, WMATA for, for bus options, but it's definitely something that is important. Mm -hmm. Um, I just see a question if the DC circulator goes by there. I don't know. That's actually, we should check that out. Um, um, there is good parking when it's not a busy time. Um, but of course that's not, that doesn't help everyone. So, um, so that is something for us to continue to look into. So thank you for bringing that point up. So I wanna thank everyone for being with us today. Thank you um, everyone for registering and taking the time out to, to listen to our, our presentation. I hope you read the report, please read the Washington Post article. Please visit us on our website, uh, fdrmemoriallegacy.com. Um, we are a nonprofit and uh, we, we need supporters and, and in all shapes and forms. So we invite you to engage with us um, and to follow our work. And we are very thankful for you choosing to spend some time with us today. Uh, major thanks to uh, Dr. Fogel Hatch for sharing her talents and her gifts with us um, for her tremendous contribution to uh, the field of, of accessibility in cultural sites and uh, for leaving her mark now on the FDR Memorial. So thank you very much. So um, thanks. Uh, this uh, will be available uh, on our website probably within a day or so. The report will be up uh, probably within the, the hour. So um, you know how to find us. Thank you all. Have a great day.